Hello, and welcome to the UNESCO Masterclass Series on Climate Change and Pacific Islands, Session 2, Disaster Risk Reduction and Ecosystem Services. I am Hélène Jacodecon from the Pacific Center for Environment and Sustainable Development at the University of the South Pacific, and today we will talk on community resilience. At the end of this session, you will be able to explain the links between natural hazards and climate change in the Pacific Island countries, define resilience, disaster risk reduction, and climate change adaptation, and identify, identify actions to increase community resilience. As you have learned in previous sessions, Pacific Islands are threatened by climate change impacts. However, they are also facing natural hazards. Some of them, called hydrometeorological hazards, are linked with weather and climate. There are the cyclones, floods, and droughts. They are the most common hazards and are causing the most damages in the Pacific Islands. Strong cyclones are commonly observed in the Pacific, south and north, except for a band between 5 degrees south and 5 degrees north, as you can see on the map here on the left-hand side. The strong cyclones area are the dark blue areas. The Pacific Islands also suffer from flood and droughts. The distribution of drought, floods and cyclones is partly controlled by the ENSO phenomenon. For example, during normal or La Nina years, the flood risk is located on the West Pacific, while the drought risk is more on the Central Pacific, as you can see on the map on the right hand side. On the contrary, during El Nino years, the drought risk is in the Western Pacific, while the flood risk is in the Central Pacific. The Pacific Islands are also threatened by other hazards, especially the geological ones like volcano, as the map on the top left, earthquakes, like you can see on the map on the bottom right, and tsunamis, with the map in the middle. They are very frequent in the region because we are located on what is called the Pacific Ring of Fires, as you can see this ring of events all around the Pacific. These hazards are not related to climate change. However, they can be very damaging for the communities and thus make them less resilient. Climate change will also have an impact on extreme weather events, on hydrometeorological hazards, and also on sea level rise that will cause more coastal erosion. For example, as you can see on the top, lines, climate change is very likely responsible for the increase of the number of warm days and warm nights, the decrease of number of cold days, cold nights, and also for the warmer temperature. And it is very likely or virtually certain that we will continue at the end of the century. Climate change is also likely responsible for the extreme sea level rise. And it's very likely that it will continue by the end of this century. Climate change is also involved in the heavy precipitation events and the intensity of duration of drought. However, the confidence of the relation between climate change and those events is a, is a bit low. All those interactions between climate change and natural hazards will also increase the risks faced by the communities and affect their resilience. Climate change will not only affect the hazard frequency and intensity, as, as we just saw, but it will also affect the capacity of the community to respond to these hazards. When a hazard occurs, the communities that are also affected by climate change may face more damages and may take longer to recover. For example, a community which has crops that are limited due to ex excess salt in the soil will have less food reserve if an event like a cyclone occurs. So climate change would thus make the community less resilient to natural hazards, even if those hazards are not, are not related to climate change. So <coughs> what exactly is resilience? Based on the definition given by the United Nations Agency for Disaster Risk Reduction, resilience is the ability of a system, community or society exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate to, and recover from the effect of a hazard in a timely and efficient manner, including through the preservation and restoration of its essential basic structure and functions. That includes, for example, water supply and food supply. Resilience built on 
and aim to protect the different assets of the community. It can be physical assets, like the houses. It can be natural assets, the ecosystems or the plantations. But also the human assets, the skilled people that are present in the community, the financial assets and the social assets, like the different links and the different networks the community is centered on. Resilience is the opposite of vulnerability, which is the characteristics and circumstances of a community system or assets that make it sus susceptible to damaging effects of a hazard. So it can be that the community is vulnerable to inundation, as you can see on the left-hand pictures, or to drought, like on the right-hand picture. There are two ways to increase community resilience based on your area of focus. Disaster risk reduction, or DRR, is focusing on natural hazards, while climate change adaptation is focusing on climate change. So disaster risk reduction includes the concept and practice of reducing disaster risk through systematic efforts to analyze and manage the cause of hazards, including through reduced exposure, lessened vulnerability of people and property, wise management of land and the environment, and improved preparedness for adverse events. This is a definition given by the UN Agency for Disaster Risk Reduction. On the other hand, climate change adaptation is the adjustment in natural or human systems in response to actual or expected climatic stimuli or the effects, which moderates harm or exploits beneficial opportunities. So you can see that those two definitions are quite different. However, the aim and the objectives are quite similar. It is to reduce damage and to make sure that the communities are prepared to be more stronger, to reduce the damage, and if possible, to exploit the opportunities. After all, a, disaster, a natural hazard and disaster, if caused, is also the opportunity to build back better. The aims are similar, as I just said, and sometimes the approaches are comparable. As a result, it makes sense in some situation to integrate disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. In the Pacific Island countries, it makes sense because the most common hazards are the hydrometeorological ones. So they are included in disaster risk reduction, but they also will be affected by climate change. So climate change adaptation should also focus on them. It's a common area that we can work on. But it also makes sense because resilience is not only a problem for today, it's a problem of tomorrow. Disaster risk reduction focuses on the present risks, while climate change adaptation focuses on the future risk. So in fact, to reach the resilience for the community, you need to incorporate both, so that your community is resilient today and also resilient tomorrow. Based on the definition of resilience, you have different approaches to improve the resilience of the communities. One way is to, imp is to reduce the risks that are faced by the community. It could include, for instance, Establish a wetland between a river that floods regularly in the community, or a dike. Build your houses on stilts so that they are not flooded. Plant the crops outside the floodplains in an area when they will be protected. But there can be also to reduce the risk of coastal erosion and coastal inundation that is a huge problem here in the Pacific Islands, as you can see in the picture on top. So for that you have different solutions. You can either plant mangroves on the coast to reduce the erosion, or you can also build a seawall, as you can see on the, on the right-hand picture. So for each problem, you have different types of solutions. But unfortunately, there is not one size fit all solution. So the solution needs to be tailored to the very specific condition of the community that is affected. So you need to be careful on what exactly is the local situation, and for that, it is extremely important and extremely beneficial to involve the local community so they can give you their in the information they have on their situation, on their capacities, so that you can decide which situation solution is the best depending on the specific threats, on the local resources, on the side effect of the solution you take, on the cost and the benefits of the solution, and so on and so forth. So you really need to be local in your solution. Another possibility 
to improve community resilience is to improve its capacity to absorb the impact. In other words, to make sure that the damage caused by the impacts do not overwhelm the community so that they can move on. So this can be done by different actions. You can, for instance, diversify the community source of income so that if, you, if something happened to the community, one source of income may be affected but not the others. You can also diversify and secure water supply or, as illustrated here in these pictures, improve uh, the food security in your community, for instance, after a drought. So you can do that by either planting drought-resistant varieties, as you can see on the right-hand side, or you can also improve the irrigation system by having more water reserve and more adapted irrigation techniques, as you can see on the left-hand side picture. Resilience also corresponds to the timely recovery of community after an impact. So another way to improve the resilience is to improve the capacity of the community to recover from the impact as soon as possible. So that means that the community needs to be prepared to react as soon as something happens. It can be made, for instance, by piling material and having skilled people in the community that are able to rebuild houses in a better way after a flooding or a cyclone. It can be also, for instance, to have seed banks or seedling nurseries that allows the farmers to replant the crops as soon as the event is over. That way, you can have your food security back very soon. What is extremely important is that we focus on no regret solutions. As I mentioned before, it is important when we talk about resilience to focus on the present threats and on the future threats. So basically, you need to focus on win-win solutions. You need to favor a solution that gives you near-term gain, gain by limiting the risk and limiting the damages by the natural hazard that we have now, but that will also preserve the long-term gains by adapting to climate change. If you focus on the solution that only are limiting the near-term losses or only limiting the loss from climate change in the long term, you only give part of the solution to the problem and you only address part of the vulnerability and the resilience of the community. So you really need to focus on win-win situation and once again it will depend on the local situation of the community and on its, on its resources. But that is a very important point. You need to make sure that whatever you do to protect the gains now will not damage the long-term gains and cause maladaptation. So, to conclude, Pacific Island countries face different hazards and some of them will be worsened by climate change. On top of that, they also face climate change impacts. To improve community resilience, it is, it is very necessary to reduce the risk from natural hazards and climate change. That can be done by a different type of actions on the ground that can achieve both at the same time. But for it to be extremely efficient and successful, it is essential to favor win-win solutions to address present and future risk and to protect the communities now and in the future. Well, that's it for this session. Thank you very much for your attention. For more comments and discussion, I will be available live on chat after this session is aired. For those of you who are enrolled in the USP MOOC, there is also extra readings available and you have a quiz to test all your knowledge on this area. All the best. Thank you.